I'm known for the Tesco advert. Well, you no, but you are. I said that last time you came on. No, but you really are because it's everywhere. They're very good, by the way. Not I love it's doing them. them. Yeah, how, I, lo- I love. I love. How many? Do you, how many have you done? Do you think? I don't know. I do them like every week. Nice. Do you yeah. do them from home? Yeah. Cool. <laughs> it's literally the best job. In the world. <laughs> and and perfect for a hermit, which you oh, confess to being. There's yes. Kermit the Frog and there's Hermit the Fern, <laughs> isn't it? Fermit the Hermit. Yeah. yeah. That is me. I love being at home. Yeah. I love being at home. And sometimes you have to consciously punch your way out of your own paper bag to get out there, don't you? I do. And I do realise sometimes that I need to push through like discomfort boundaries and do something different. But I think, you know, all of us sat here now, and there'll be many people listening to this, have very social jobs and we talk a lot to people. And <laughs> Too much. I need to, yeah, be, I need to retreat and be in solitude, which is also quite hard in my house, but at yeah. least... I'm home, so yeah, I need that balance. Yeah, footballers don't play football all day. No, yeah. hey, kids do, but footballers yeah. don't. There's, there's an irony there out. somewhere. I think so. Little things, Fern Cotton. Fern is so good at writing books that if you go to Foils and you go to the fifth floor to the help and um, self improvement and mindfulness section, she has her own section, everybody. <laughs> and Little Things is about to add to that. So move up, whoever is next to you on the bookshelves. Who would be next to you? I don't uh, know. Cotton. Oh, oh, Deepak uh, Chopra. He'd be. Oh, he'd have gosh. to move over. No, he gets the mention, give doesn't Deepak he? Deepak more room. He needs all the shelf space. He's the best. Yeah, you podcasted with him. So, so the book is wonderful. It's a book full of thoughts, uh, little things that could help in a very sort of tiny habits, sort of, sort of um, atomic habits kind of kind of way, but a, a softer, gentler uh, offering than those, I would say. Also, there's the A team. You know, there's the A team. There's Hannibal and his mates. You've got the S team. You've got the stress team that you've talked to, haven't you? You've got your mates on board. Yeah. Um, so you've got your actual mates IRL you've got professional mates that have been on the podcast so um, straight off the bat a couple of your friends get a mention um, is it Abby? Abby wonderful Abby yeah, yeah. she's one of my friends and neighbours mm-hmm. and she's got a beautiful family she's got twins and one of her twins has cerebral palsy and of course there are many studies and stats that show that parents of um, children with disabilities have the most sort of prolonged stress and she gives some brilliant coping tools that she uses to deal with the you know, just daily stress of having a very busy family and yeah. hospital appointments and um, and everything that she has to go through. So I was so grateful for the for the interviews in this book. Yeah, and it also gave you this reason not only to to recount podcast conversations that you had and, and transcribe those and print the highlights of those in the book, which are supremely helpful from absolute experts, but to talk to your mates who you've been with for lots much of your life about something that you. And you're you're a talk. You're happy to talk about this kind of yeah, stuff, but even but you, you had not broached these particular boundaries. No, I think you? sometimes you you sort of bypass the obvious with friends, don't you? And you Fran. Don't say, Fran was the other one. Oh yeah, Fran. So Fran's one of my oldest friends. We've been friends since we were five. Yeah. And Fran is an air steward, and obviously when you have a public facing role like that, and you're dealing with customers and travellers, expectations. Yeah, and you, you you know you end up being the brunt of someone's bad journey. Yeah. And Fran's got some again really good coping tools that she uses to deal with that and to kind of leave work behind her at the end of the day and let things go so yeah each interview is very valuable i have a friend who stores up his stress until he goes on holiday so he can just vent it at the airport to anybody and everyone oh, no. that he comes across <laughs> yeah he literally he sees Don't an go airport on holiday with him <laughs> no i did once it was oh. awful i went wait a minute nothing's going wrong here <laughs> no. and he's like i didn't recognize him i thought oh and he's why this is what he does he stores it up all year he's the nicest guy in the world when he's not in an airport. No, that's not great. I mean, by all means, I guess, sort of store it up and then let it out by, like, punching a pillow or screaming it's not into a person, the, metaphorically yeah, the or forest, actually. but not on other people. Uh, you asked straight off the bat, this book, by the way, Little Things, Fern Cotton is what we're talking about. Uh, straight off the bat, you asked the difference between stress and anxiety. Some people think there is a difference. Some people think there isn't a difference. Um, but your first guest who you Judd talked Brewer, to, Dr. Yeah. Jude... Judd. Sorry, sorry, Dr. Joe yeah, yeah. uh, says yes. Stress is more in the moment. Anxiety is sort of future based. Yeah, and there's sort of there's not a clear participant with anxiety, whereas there usually is with stress. So we can usually pinpoint a cause with stress and say this is stressing me out. Whereas yeah. with anxiety, it can be quite um, ambiguous, and you, you can't quite pinpoint it, or you think you can, but actually, it's probably a whole host of reasons yeah. you're feeling anxious. So, so the different chapters cope with different aspects of stress, and then at the end of each little section, there's the little things section because the book is called Little Things. Little things to help with overwhelm. You have this this chapter on this these sort of section on overwhelm. Not so much chapters, which is good because they're not as big. They're not mountains to get through. No, I didn't want any of it to be because look, everyone's stressed. Everyone's had extremely stressful situations happen in their lives. 
lives and all of us are dealing with just micro sort of stress throughout the day. Yeah. So all of it's got to be manageable and small. And I'm not coming from a point of view where I've nailed this. I am often extremely stressed. And sometimes I really fly off the handles and I'm a hot head and I don't deal with things well. So I needed to write this book. I nearly bailed halfway through the writing of it because it felt... <laughs> I started feeling really stressed <laughs> about writing this stress book. And I was but like, you would, wouldn't you? Mm, this can't be right. But that actually allowed me to be much more curious about what my triggers were. Yeah, and, yeah. you know, you have to go go back to childhood to some extent yeah. where how you are modelled coping with stress, how you react to it versus respond to it. And that's quite difficult at times and could be quite humbling because you've got to also look at how much autonomy you have over it. Like, yes, there are things that are plain stressful and there's no getting around that. But I think all of us have a little bit more agency over how much stress we're letting in and how we're coping with it. And none of us want to necessarily look at that. We yeah. just want to it's the creeping point stress. I mean, you know, yeah. if, you, if you have these big stressful situations like illness or financial risk, of course they're stressful, but you're sort of brought up expecting those to be stressful. Your mum gets a look and you have a big chat to your mum in the book. I do, because she... My mum had polymyalgia, which is a very uncomfortable... Um, so glad you said that. Have. I was rehearsing that word all last night in case I had to ask you. <laughs> My mum used to call it a uh, poly. Uh, Polly's playing yeah. up. So it's very painful inf inflammatory disorder. And my mum's pretty aware that that was brought on by stress. And my mum had very sort of prolonged stress for a long period of life, probably from childhood, actually. And a lot of it undealt with. And she's now got to a point where she's not on steroids anymore. She's pretty much pain free. Her mobility is really, really good. And she's changed a few things in her lifestyle again, little things like made some tweaks and lowered how lowered her stress, but also looked at how she manages it. And she's in great shape. So it was really interesting talking to her about that because she went through like five, six years of, you know, horrible pain and discomfort. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, it's funny that you talk about the fact you're stressed and you're a hothead. I've known you for ages now, years and years. It's a real pleasure to know you, by the way. Oh, and you. And um, I've never seen you like that. And oh, it's yeah. funny because, <laughs> no, clearly you are. And I believe, I'm not saying I don't believe you. <laughs> this whole stress book is a load of nonsense. Um, I completely believe you. But what's testament to the work that you put in is that I haven't seen you like that. So mm. you feel like that a lot and you are like that a lot and that's how you get up and you exist. Um, but because you put the work in, it's okay for the rest of us. You're taking the burden of your stress off the rest of us and that's what we should all be doing. Well, look, I hope so. I think, you know, sometimes, yes, there's certainly been moments where like coming here today, I didn't have any anxiety and I feel really calm on air. But there was a period, say, three years ago where I was in the thick of panic attacks and the thick of anxiety and I probably came on this show in that state and I managed to look relatively calm to everybody but inside I was freaking out and I was freaking out before I probably hadn't slept and then I would stress and replay everything that I'd said for about four hours afterwards that's the, that's the, the worst. worst so I got to a very <laughs> good place with that in ways I still wouldn't feel comfortable presenting a live tv show which is so weird I've done that with you yeah. without any stress but because of certain situations and periods of panic I still wouldn't want to put myself in that position yeah. so that you, might and you be don't in need the future to, but but I, don't, I don't want to at the moment but maybe in the future there's more choice around that if I keep doing the work. But there are still situations where it could be tiny things, like I'm late on the school run, like micro stresses where I can feel that stress building. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. at some point, you know, I'll snap and it could be at my poor husband or it might just be, you know, I'm not dealing with things well and I abandon the projects I'm working on. It will come out in other ways. Yeah, so I think yeah, yeah. there are some parts of my life. You set fire to it in a way. Yeah, yeah. So I think, but then I'm also pretty aware that if you know i go for a run or if i you know do a workout or i get it physically out get of into me, the body it'll be better get it into the physical so it can come out of the physical yeah if you, yeah and, and the thing about feeling stress and, and f having a sense of it building up well that's the beginning of, of the end in a way because the fact you are feeling it as opposed to it just happening and you're not even feeling it, it's like the tremors of an earthquake before the earthquake happens and then the next that you know all this the next sort of mile along that road is being aware of it as it's happening so you're no longer feeling it you're aware of the fact you're feeling it yeah and then you're aware of the fact that 
that you could be aware that you might feel this stress going into a certain point and that's when you already just the recognition of that moment in your life and that recurring situation that happens all the time every day don't hope it doesn't happen expect it to happen that's when you can give yourself permission to breathe again yeah. and it, not that you've done anything about it other than begin to recognise it. Think, You've opened the curtains and you can see the view and you know what it looks like. Totally. I think awareness stops it going into chronic stress. Yeah. I think when we're not aware, that's where we normalise it and we're just like, well, this is how I feel all the time every day. Yeah. And then chronic stress, as my mum talks about in the book, can turn physical very, very quickly. Yeah, yeah, and it yeah. could be in a small way. Like I was talking to you guys before, I had a sty in my eye over Christmas and I'm pretty sure I pushed myself way too much at the end of the year. And I was stressed and I wasn't looking at it. I was pushing through, no rest, must do more. And then I had this huge bug eye for about a month. <laughs> and it will come out. It will come I out physically. I spy with my little sty. <laughs> exactly. My rather huge... A load of stress. <laughs> swollen eye. Um, often we'd... It's very helpful to zoom out. It's very helpful to zoom out and to get ahead of issues as they're, you know they're going to come your way and perhaps they won't come your way, but at least you're ready for them. You've positioned yourself right. They say an idiot in the right position can look like a genius and a genius in the wrong position can look like an idiot. And one way to do this is to zoom out to 10,000 feet, but you zoom out a lot further than that. Oh, yes. I love that. I was like, oh, I might zoom out a little bit more. Keep zooming out until... The How far do you go? Until planet Earth is just in a <laughs> mass of other little bright dots yeah. like keep going and keep going i think we forget that we're sat on a floating ball in infinite space and that one always helps me out like i am just a speck of nothingness on another speck of nothingness in infinite space yeah that helps doesn't mean you're nothing doesn't mean you're nothing you, you are value. everything and nothing completely that's, that's a wonderful point, paradox to put to us because we are and if we can get that perspective i think all the micro stresses of I'm late, I messed up, I shouldn't have said that thing I said, which we all do. I think we assume that we're the only ones. We all make these little mistakes throughout the day and we all get stressed about these yeah. tiny things. They slowly dissipate if we can just zoom out a little bit. But also, bit. if you're not making mistakes, you're not trying hard enough. We talk about it all the time. Yeah, you and know, we're going to keep making mistakes. Get forever. up in the morning, get ready to make a load more mistakes, then go to bed at night and do the same again tomorrow. Correct. You know, um, rinse and repeat. Yes. <laughs> so Bradley Wiggins has been on your podcast, The Happy Place Podcast. I haven't heard that episode. Reading this book makes me want to listen to oh. it and just talking about it now has given me goosebumps. I can't wait to hear that. So Bradley um, retired from being as good at cycling, or his particular flavour of cycling, than anybody's ever been before um, to protect his mental health. So he did yeah. recognise it. He knew what was going on. I've read his book, his own book. He was due to come on our show to talk about it and cancelled at the last minute, which I think was, I don't know, by the way, I don't know, I think was the beginning of his acceptance that he needs to make a major change. Yeah, you know, that's it's really interesting because when he came on the podcast, he was actually about an hour late, which I thought was interesting in itself, that I think he was anticipating what we were going to talk about. And it was so brilliant. I was so grateful of how honest he was because... He wasn't coming from the point of view of, I've done all the work and now I'm really healed. He was in the thick of it. Yeah. And he was so brilliantly vulnerable, which I think is really important in terms of the male context of talking about mental health. Yeah. And he just laid it all out on the table as to where he was at. And it was one of the most powerful podcasts. I was so in the moment, just transfixed. I barely speak in that episode. Right. It's just handing over to Bradley to let him tell his story so that one felt like a when was particular honour it wasn't long ago maybe a year, less than a year ago a year ago how, how so. is he do you think I don't know I don't know I think he's just doing the work and you know he's got the awareness that yeah. certain things don't work for him which is a huge part of well, it well you know being aware I mean it's, it's more than half the battle it is we're all fascinated by your fag free fag breaks yep. tell us about those well I don't smoke and I don't advocate <laughs> it but I think the joy of the joy for smokers is you get to walk out of your place of work or your home and have five minutes outside and w none of us do that unless we smoke so when I'm working at home, it could be writing or recording something. I just try and take myself outside without my phone. And that's the other good thing about smoking, which is there's no other good bit. But, you know, you're, you're using a hand to do something. So I've you're not on your phone. I've got a third good bit. I can give you a third good <laughs> okay. bit. No, carry on. I'll, I'll, so I'll add to this in a you're minute. Not, you know, you're not on your phone and you're just looking around. I always look at smokers and think, I'm quite jealous that you get to do that. So you just go outside do five minutes of like having some deep breaths and looking about and shivering and thinking, God, why am I having a fag in the cold? But you're not smoking. And that's just a little 
moment's break in what would otherwise be a relentless day of just tasks that you're taking off a list. So a lot of people, when they get itchy and they're smokers and they go nip outside, this building is a testament to that. Uh, it's usually every 90 minutes, which is the end of your circadian rhythm. Ah. And, and it's w- when, when you're working away and you're writing or you're... You, it's usually mental work, to be honest. And um, when you're doing some kind of knowledge work or... or, or I don't know, writing stuff down um, or reading or or whatever it may be, organising. Every 90 minutes, you'll get a lull in your focus, your concentration. And it's because it's the end of your circadian rhythm. And you are useless at that point. And that's when people who don't smoke go and make a cup of tea or go and have a chat or have a shocky bicky. That's when temptation creeps in. Yeah. Because you know you're not at your... You know... You don't know you know, but you know that you're not at your best. You think, this is all pointless at the moment. Um, and that's when people tend to nip out for a fact. That wasn't my third accessorization to what will now be a holy trinity, holy trinity of if if what why if smoking wasn't bad for you and kills you would might be good for you. Yeah. The actual third one is because when you smoke, you automatically take a deep inhale. Yes. Which is what you're taught to do in meditation. So you go, especially on the first drag of a fag. It's these long inhales and exhales. So it is It is vicarious meditation that also, unfortunately, happens to kill you. Yeah, to just so do it without the fag. Just, get, just do it without the fag. The fag yeah. is brilliant. But isn't it <laughs> funny that that was something that, you know, 10, 20 years ago, it was completely accepted and nobody questioned. And I was like, I'm just popping outside for a cigarette break and yeah. everybody would allow you to do that. And if you could rebrand that as like, I'm popping outside for a mindful so, a break. break. A circadian rhythm break. break. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, because if you said to people, I need to take five minutes, people might be they need to take five. Yeah. Oh, oh God. What's pathetic. wrong? With, oh, yeah, what's going yeah. on? Oh, is there something going on? Yeah. Whereas if they said I'm going out for a fag, go. All right. See you yeah, in five. See yeah. Um, Mad. And it still happens here, doesn't it? And the thing about it, it's the distraction issue with the, with the workplace because once you stop a task, it's so difficult to start. It. That's why they say if you look at an email, one email. If you, if you allow yourself an email look, you know, every fifteen minutes, or say every half an hour. If you look at one email, it apparently takes you half an hour to recover from that one email, regardless of what it says, because yeah. it's because it's interrupted your your yeah. flow. And so you might as well look at twenty. That's what they say. So you you like bat- batching in life. You do think about batching, batch yeah. cooking, batch thinking. You know, batch everything. Uh, why the heck not? We had Delicious De Ella on last week, who was brilliant. I love Ella. Yeah, and she says cook once, eat twice. Oh, I love her new book. I've already cooked loads yeah, from we it. Yeah, did it. She brought all the made stuff. Made the cookies, in. Oh, made the cauliflower the curry at the weekend. It's the best it's ever. dream. Best ever. Laughing and smiling. <clears throat> um, they say that let food be thy medicine. They said that, of course. Uh, but also laughter is an amazing tonic. It is also a real sign of, of good mental health. Yeah, I think if you can turn some... It doesn't have to be like huge adversities, but moments of perhaps like extreme embarrassment into something funny or sometimes you can yeah you can turn things that feel really icky to look at into something quite funny yeah not all things because obviously some things are just plain awful but there are situations i can think back to that i was so embarrassed about like i say in the book there was an episode i'm cringing saying this it was an episode of my podcast a few years ago where i called (laughs) one of the guests the slightly wrong name for about half an hour then I twigged that I'd got the wrong name. And I don't know how. This is so unlike me because I'm so prepped. I'm so researched. Yeah. The podcast was on Zoom. I hate Zoom. It was at about 8 o'clock at night. Cognitively, that's not my time for brilliance. It's nobody's time. Really. I was all over the shop. And I, for months, beat myself up about this. And now I can talk about it in a jovial way with levity just and about. laugh. Just, just about. <laughs> just about. My, <laughs> my fingers clench into my own palms. Oh, so you, you sort of blinked nervously then as you said it. Flinching, talking yeah. about it. But I think you can do that a little more often and usually it's telling someone else the story and they laugh and then they share a story and they laugh about one of their mishaps that takes the the heat and the spike out of those situations yeah there was there was a guy who was giving this um lecture on i can't remember what it was but it was to the u.s military and it was about like life hacks and this and the other and he he was a very young uh, professor totally qualified but he's literally in front of all these these sort of these these crusty rusty concrete hearted generals um he gets up there to speak to them about life coaching and they just don't want to hear him and so he starts off he, th- he says look i may look about 12 okay and that didn't work because oh. vulnerability is your superpower yeah. brenny brown you know all this kind that of didn't stuff didn't work um didn't work and you thought oh that's not work and there was just silence and then one of the generals smiled and said well maybe 13 (laughs) 
and then everybody laughed and he's okay. So We're in. For vulnerability, vulnerability slash humour. Yeah. Uh, you've got this going on today. Vassis is giving a talk today later. Are what, you? What's your three tenets of your talk? Uh, we have dedication, drive and determination. Ooh, yeah. three days. Yeah. Any, any tips for him sponsors. talking today? Oh, you know what you're doing. Just do it. Oh, thanks. Yeah, just oh, be yeah. you. You're, you do it all the time. It could be your third D, just do it. What is just it? Go do on. it. Add it on. Dedication, drive, determination, just do it. Yeah, Come on. perfect. Just yeah, nice. The quickest talk ever. Good slogan, oh, I think that. the only thing that stands in just our way... Just do it, just do it. Good yeah. slogan. The, the only thing that stands in our way with any of this stuff is the horrible little acerbic voice in our own heads. No one else is thinking all these awful things about us. Nobody cares. Judging us. No one cares. thinking about us at all. No one cares. Um, do you know that great phrase, um, it's none of my business what other people think about me? Yeah. It's the best, the best. It's We've so had to useful. learn that one. It's We've had so to useful. learn it. Yeah. Yeah, we went to boot camp for that one, didn't we? We sure did. <laughs> we went to hell week for we that one. We went to hell. It was, it's still awful. Tell us about your anti-stress food cupboard. I love your anti-stress food. Yeah, there are, there are a few foods that obviously do things that can help us in many ways. I mean, I am plant-based. There's lots of goodness there. Ella would have talked about this last week, eating lots of, you know, protein-rich foods like chickpeas and pulses and all that old-fashioned, boring, but lovely stuff. Um, so I think, you know, reducing sugar and caffeine, all the obvious things are always going to help with stress. And just being mindful of some people when they're very stressed will not eat at all. And that, you know, might lead to a huge sort of blood sugar crash or my tendency is to eat a lot of sugary snacks. So if I'm feeling stressed, I'm mm. comfort eating. I'm grabbing biscuits and I'm needing sugary things. And again, goes back to awareness of just going, this probably isn't going to work for me. I'm going to feel even worse after I've done this. So yeah. again, it always just goes back to that awareness of why you're doing it. Yeah, so if you can do things that are good for you but are hard and you can build in reward systems into the moment you've got to build into things that are bad for you habits that have bad, bad habit energy you've yes. got to build in bar barbed wire yeah in the moment haven't you yeah Going, so judd brewer just... who i interview he taught he's a habit expert so yeah. he talks about the feeling like the crest of a wave where you like he deals with a lot of people that do smoke and they have that feeling of i can't i can't cope unless i have a cigarette right this second that feeling will dissipate. It yeah. does for anything if you've got an urge to look at your phone, to have another glass of wine, to online shop when you don't need to. More food. We have that feeling, we have that feeling, and then that crest just start, slightly dissipates and dips yeah. again. But we don't give it the chance. We are impulsive in that moment. So he does a whole brilliant section on habits. And when we're stressed, we absolutely go for our bad habit. That's the first thing that all of us yeah. do, because it's easy. And when, and when we're, you know, when we haven't really got to grips with even uh, admitting to ourselves that we have a bad habit the net the bad the next bad habit energy is on a straight road a sort of autobahn a, a speed limitless autobahn that we're already on then when you get a sense of it there's a little kink in that road but it's there's still no turning then there's a sharper bend as you as, as the habit energy changes and it gets worse for you so you're cruising you think life's under control and then then there's a sort of sharper bend in the road but there's still no alternative to being on that road and then you come to a t-junction and you can pause but you still turn the wrong way then you come to a t-junction and you stop and you don't turn at all and then you turn left instead of right and if you can turn left instead of right that gets you off the crest of the wave yeah so he talks about don't set long-term goals like i'm never going to do that thing again yeah because none of us stick to that we just think well what's the point I, what is the actual goal here whereas yeah. if we just work daily and in the moment of riding that wave yeah. you then notice oh i haven't smoked or online shopped or and gambled or whatever for better. a week and i feel better and yeah. it's that and it's noticing the reward system in that it's, it's genius crazy, oh it's not me it was judd honestly I'm no just i know but you're the said. conduit and he won't mind you saying that he won't mind me saying that you're the conduit you know the, the ha for, for the to get salt in your fish and chips it's got to be in the cellar well i need to learn this stuff cellar, you cellar. know i'm i'm seeking it cellars in the cellar um <laughs> Oh, we're almost out of time. I love, I love the open and close theory, which I'd forgotten about. Because yes. the reason all these things are called practices is because if you forget to do them for a second, you can then forget to do them for a year. Yeah, isn't it mad? Yeah. If, if you can meditate every day, if you meditate like or, or whatever you do, I know I say meditate too often, but even I meditate at six o'clock every day and at six a.m. and four a, four p.m. every day. The reason you 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 set it and forget it is because if you don't and you forget it once because you haven't set it, you can literally go for a year without yeah. remembering. Because that's how sort of that's that's in a way if you can 
enhance that, harness that. That's that's our superpower. Yeah. But it can also be detrimental to our well-being if we forget that we are that haphazard in what we think is the most organised of lives. All of us are. We're all the same. We all lean on bad habits. We all can't be bothered at times. We've all got to put... We can't be bothered when we can be bothered. I know. That's the worst one. <laughs> You know, I'm trying to be really bothered. Oh, but I forgot for a second. And then you look like somebody who really can't be bothered ever. Yeah, we're all on... It's a thin veneer. Oh, anyway, the it? open and close thing. So I forgot about the open and close. I used to live by the open and close thing and yes. I forgot about it so I read your book. Yeah. So if things are going well in the conversation, at the gym, you know, at the sweet shop, on the bus, in bed, asleep, having about any second of any day of any month or year of your life then your 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 heart and you are open and then the second you feel at all antagonistic or anxious about anything or uncomfortable it immediately closes and there's no in between nope we're totally open now you yeah. and i we're open now today sometimes we're not during links sometimes we go close close up and then we've got to one of us got to open again or you know but just explain the open and closed theory from your point of view and how people can deploy it now well, often when we're stressed, it's because we are extremely closed and, we'll, and we're all bespoke in that way. So for me, to feel really open, it might involve being out in nature, like a very obvious one. But, you know, seeing a very beautiful scene in nature, seeing a sunrise, or it could be I've got a new little kitten. So playing with little Frank. Have you actually? Yeah. Oh, good for you. So in love with him. He's a rescue kitten. I feel extremely open when I'm playing with little Frank and I'm in the moment. Frank and we've got another cat called Simon um, but that is a good example of me feeling very open or when I'm writing I'm really open and I feel really al it's a sense of feeling very alive and very in tune and then we all know the moments where we feel very very close so for me it's probably you know scrolling on social media too long or someone being rude out of the blue that I wasn't expecting or seeing injustice somewhere I close up and I it's a physical tension it's a mental tension and it's stress at the end of the day so I sort of give a little page there where you can write down just notice in your day things that made you feel very open and alive and connected and things that make you feel very closed and small and tense and I think again going back to awareness noticing those things gives us a bit more autonomy over oh I'll probably do that more like today after this I hope to squeeze in going for a nice walk in the park before I crack on with the rest of my day yeah, yeah, and yeah. having that openness and those little moments they really count I think they add up well, as I say, there is the world famous Atomic Habits by James Clear. And then there's BJ Fogg's Tiny Habits, which, to be honest, Atomic Habits was sort of born out of. Because do you know that James Clear used to be a student of BJ Fogg's? No. Yeah. I didn't know that. And then there's Fern's Little Things, which I think is a lovely bedfellow to those two books. It's beautiful. A positive toolkit for when life feels stressful. They're going to have to get a bigger shelf at Foils for Fern's <laughs> books. Fern's section, if you'll forgive the I've got the fiction coming out in June. So that'll be a whole other area that I'm going to be in. Fiction? I'm so excited. I've been working on it for about two and a half years. No, when you were stressed, fiction is really hard to write. Oh, I've, it's been pure... That's been open, open, open. What so is it? Much what is it? Is it a thriller? Is it nope, a, it's like a strange fancy tale with sort of an underlying moral story going on. It's called Scripted. I am a buzzed about what, it. Is it young adult? Is it grown ups? Is grown it... up. Yeah. Grown up book. Um, oh, I love books. Because I'm even so Fern Cotton's a grown up nowadays, everybody. Actual, in the thick of my 40s, everyone. By the way, no, no, no afraid to work with the loads. Um, still, always taller than I think she is. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, always. You walk in. On. Yeah, I know you got your heels on it, but you wear. <laughs> I always forget how tall she is. Even at the festivals we do and all this kind of. I go, Why? Why? Why do I always think that? But you, I don't know, know, everyone's always small in real life, aren't they? Like pop stars, you go, oh my god, they're tiny. Some are, some yeah, yeah. yeah James Blunt is. Um, <laughs> <laughs> who I love to death and he's doing gig in the garden press this year so um, well done uh, congratulations thank you very much thank from you. the almost taller than you think Fern Cotton <laughs> have you seen Saltburn uh, no but me and my husband are desperate do you know what <laughs> because my kids are going to bed so late these days by the time they're in bed I'm too tired <laughs> exactly I go to bed straight after they, them no they put well honestly I'm not being cute my kids put me in bed all the time even now on Fridays and Saturdays and I love it yeah. they can't co quite cope with it in fact we were watching Memento last week. Tash and I have a movie club now. We watch half the movie on a Friday and half it on a Saturday. That's the way to do it. That's the way to do it. <laughs> no point in clinging on. No. There's lost energy in clinging on, everyone. <laughs> and um, and we were watching Memento, which was so good, we stayed with it till 10.40 p.m. on that Saturday so night. Late. And Noah had to go to bed before us, and he thought that wasn't right all of a sudden. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Saltburn, you will not be disappointed. I can't wait. He won't watch it. Why? It's not for me. Really? Why, why not? Seems all a bit sort of twisted and dark. Yeah, that's why I like it. Mm. 
I can't wait. <laughs> I'm here for it. Yeah, we love it. I'm going to watch it again at the weekend, I think. Do it. Uh, Fern, thanks. Thank you. I love coming on this show. We love having you on what the show. What a joy. It's always a yeah. Virgin Radio.